Welcome to the IT240 Week 1 lecture video. Um, you guys all seem like you've got off to a great start for the Week 1 work. Um, and let's take a look at that Week 1 work real quick. Um, so the first part of it, you were to click on here and kind of participate into this discussion topic. Um, it is still open, still available. Um, I'm using this as my attendance for the first week, so it's pretty important that you do participate. Um, if you don't, there's a chance that you could get dropped, um, but I, I will, uh, I'll probably give you the weekend. And for the most part, it looks like everyone is already um, locked in and engaged, so I don't anticipate anybody dropping, so good job for filling this out. The other part, um, there was a quick assignment answering a couple of questions about um, what did you want to get out of the class. And then there's actually work. Um, and so we're going to click on here and take a look at the work that was assigned. So the first part was to read chapters one and two from the online book. We probably will not be using this book that much anymore. I, this was probably going to be it. Um, I just wanted us to be acclimated to the book. Um, it is an ebook, but there there'll be other texts brought in. Um, so yeah, if if you did start reading this, this is great. The first couple of chapters kind of gives you uh, an overview of Linux and what free software really means, and um, and viewing Linux as an operating system and what does that really mean. Um, so we're starting off fairly basic in the week one. Um, we're not doing any Linux commands yet. Um, we will get into Linux terminal commands and um, studying the different types of commands, understanding how how they work and um, and how to how to harness them to get things done. Um, and so once you've read those. Um, and we'll let's quickly peek over to that Linux Essentials book. Um, it is on the main page, so we'll go back. And if you scroll down, you will see that Linux Essentials manual. You can just download that, and there you go. Um, and so we have Chapter 1. We're talking about computers, software, and operating systems. Um, we look at the different types. Okay. Um, Linux is different from Windows. It is different from Macintosh. Although um, I would say that it's more closer to Macintosh than it is Windows. And so we'll be looking at the differences and similarities in Chapter 1. There's a summary. And then finally, number 2, Chapter 2 here is dealing with um, the Linux free open source, you know, what type of license is it given under or distributed under? How is it maintained? Um, here's another section in chapter two important free software. Okay. And also, um, it turns out that there are different. Linux distributions. So these are all Linux operating systems, but they're vastly different from one another. And so they are distinguished by uh, their, their names and what they're used for. And these are called Linux distributions. And there are more, there are more than just these, right? Kali Linux is one that we're very familiar with. That is another Linux distribution that is used for um, offensive security. All right, red team, blue team um, for cybersecurity and, and things of this sort. And Linux, the uh, Kali Linux is hugely, uh, hugely important. Um, again, we did look at the Parrot operating system. There's another one there, a, a, another pin testing type of operating system. And when we say pen testing, we do mean penetration testing, uh, trying to infiltrate into um, 
a bad guy's machine to stop them from doing what they're doing. <laughs> um, and then chapter three is just isn't assigned, but I'm I will leave this for you. And this book will be a resource for you. Um, we may reference this book, but for the most part, uh, I just want you to get started off and run for the first week just to get this good language down for chapter one and chapter two. So, and if you want a quick peek inside chapter one, um, you know, I, I find it, it, it is, it is kind of interesting when you start to think of the components of a computer, the hardware and software, the processor, or sometimes we call it the CPU, and how does it really come about, right? Um, how are all those components working together? And, um, and so this is just kind of a broad little overview of, of the nuances of how your machine works, the different components. So, you know, all, all the computers have a motherboard, And this is what really controls the flow of the electricity, <laughs> the power that is going through there. It's rerouting everything, moving things through the processor and back and forth and going to different areas of the machine. Uh, the motherboard is, is um, something I'm pretty much sure we're all familiar with. And if you ever built your computer, then you are vastly familiar with what a motherboard is is all about. Hard disks, okay. Optical drives, right, display, peripherals, and um, we get into the software. Um, and there's something called the firmware Right, stored on the computer's motherboard and can only be changed or replaced inconveniently, if at all. It is used to put the computer into a defined state after switching it on. Often there is a way of invoking a setup mode that allows you to set the clock, enable or disable certain properties of the motherboard. The firmware, the firmware has a name, it's called the BIOS stands for basic input output system. Sometimes they call it the EFI. Um, this is another nice little point. Some other boards include a small Linux system that purportedly boots more quickly than Linux and which is supposed to be used to surf the internet or watch DVD without having to boot into Windows. Whether this is actually worth the trouble is up to debate. Interesting. Um, and we get into the operating system, which is what controls your computer and manages your computer, the use of your machine. Um, another section, the most important operating systems. Subsection is here is uh, Windows and OS. These are the, the two big guys. I think Linux is there. Here's this, the story behind it. You'll see this referenced quite a lot. And here's a summary. Today's PCs, whether based on Linux, Windows, or OS X, have more similarities than differences. As far as their hardware, their basic concepts, and their use is concerned. But without doubt, you can use any of the three to go about your daily work, and none of them is obviously or uncontestably the best. However, this manual talks mostly about Linux, and we will use the rest of these pages to, to provide an intro to that system that is extensive as possible.
will explain its use, highlight its strengths, and, where necessary, point out its weaknesses. And uh, Linux is a serious alternative to the other two systems and surpasses them in various aspects, and some of them widely. And I'll just give you an example. I was recently working on a program, and I wanted to run this piece of code that I got. I wanted to download certain, it was a Python program, and I needed to download certain packages and this and that and the third. And I went to my Windows machine, I spun up Python, I downloaded the packages, and some of those downloads went all over the place. They were installed on a different Python version that I was using. The environment setup was, was, was really off. There were certain dependencies out of date, and you know, you really have to maintain and update a lot of your packages and things of this sort when you're in Windows and Macintosh. And then I just realized, I'm like, you know what, forget it. I'm going to just do this in Linux. And just in a matter of minutes, I was up and running. I downloaded what I needed to download. My program ran. I got my output, and I was happy. So there's a reason why there are hundreds of different languages. Some do better than others for certain things. When you're trying to build or when you're trying to get a job done, um, some just are used for different things which will make it easier to do than others. That's the same reason why there are a lot of restaurants, a lot of different clothing uh, uh, stores. It's not just taste, but it's what the clothes are for, what they're not for. There's price, there's taste, so much. Let's take a peek at chapter two. So now this is where you're diving in more specifically about Linux. Um, obviously, you don't have to pay for Linux like you do the others, especially Windows. We did mention about Windows Pro, for example. You know, to enable virtualization, you have to have the Windows Pro edition. So make sure, find out what, what edition is your Windows machine if you if you are running Windows. I think if you're using a Mac, you probably will have that ability to create virtual machines and things of this sort. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not much of a Macintosh user, to be honest. we're starting to talk about Unix and also Linux, right? There's two different types of things going on. And so the story is in the early 90s, we call this guy Lunas Travels. I can't pronounce that. He was 21 years old, studying computer science. At the time, he owned a 386 PC that he wanted to experiment with and amused himself by writing a terminal emulator which ran on the raw hardware without an operating system, and which allowed him to access the university's Unix system. This is like some kind of hacking thing he did. Uh, 
This program grew into the first Linux operating system kernel. Unix was around, well, uh, Unix was already about 20 years old at that point, but was the operating system of choice at universities and wherever research and development were done. The scientific workstations of the time almost exclusively ran on various versions of Unix. Um, and Unix itself had started, almost like Linux, as a hobby-type project of Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie at Bell Labs, the American telecommunication giant, AT&T's research arm. It very quickly mutated into quite a useful system, and since it was written, for the most part, in a high-level language we call C, it could be purported reasonably quickly to other computing platforms than the original PDP-11. This is interesting stuff, right? In addition, during the 1970s, AT&T was forced by a consent decree to refrain from selling software. So Unix was given away at cost, without support. And since the system was small and fairly straightforward, it became a popular case study in the operating system seminars of most universities. Uh, toward the end of the 70s, though, students at Cal Berkeley ported Unix to the VAX, the successor of the PD-11, and introduced various improvements that began to be circulated as BSD. Various offshoots of BSD are still currently, still current today. Uh, Minix. To develop the first version of Linux, Lunas made use of Minix, a Unix-like operating system written for teaching purposes by Andrew of the Free University of Amsterdam, Minix was deliberately kept simple and it wasn't fairly available, so it did not represent a serious operating system. Help was obviously needed. Yeah, I mean, to make these commercial projects, a lot of people don't realize that even when, when it comes to um, video games, for example, I'll use video games as an, as an example. Um, there's a big difference between the indie games and commercial games, right? Like, there's a big difference between a Minecraft and a Call of Duty. And the major difference is the, the number of people who created it. And there are hundreds of people who worked on that commercial video game, like the Call of Duty franchise, and, and actually developing the Call of Duty game. Um, whereas in Minecraft, I think there was only two guys that did, uh, that produced that. And same thing with these operating systems. Like, one of us could create our own operating system, but if it is ever to be used by the public, by a lot of people, it's going to need to be polished up. And um, and the only way to really do that, well, not the only way, but one of the ways that 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 has been done, is by just freely distributing it and having a community to help develop it. So yeah. Um, and so here's what happened that by the end of the summer, right? And this guy's still around today. I, 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 I saw a video of him. I guess it was a tour of his house or something, and people send him penguins. I don't know. He's an old dude now, probably in his, uh, he's in his 50s. Um, he's not that old. But, um, 
He announced his project to the public and invited the rest of the world to join in. At this point, the system functioned as an alternative operating system kernel for Minix. Um, and so at the time, the system didn't yet have a proper name, so Linux called it FreeX. Well, Freak and Unix. He, he, he did briefly consider Linux, but rejected this as too egotistical. When Linux system was uploaded to the university FTP server, Linux colleagues, who didn't like the name Freaks, took the liberty of renaming it to Linux. Linux later approved of the change. Linux gener generated considerable interest, and many volunteers decided to collaborate. Um, and as you can see, Linux 0 0.99, the first version licensed under the GPL, the General Public License, appeared in December, a year and a half later, um, nearly a year and a half later, and represented quite a grown-up operating system with complete, if simple, Unix functionality. Um, yeah. Linux 2.0 appeared in early 96 and introduced some important new features such as support for multiprocessors and the ability to load kernel modules at runtime, an important innovation along the road to user-friendly Linux distributions. Uh, another new feature was Tux, the penguin. And that is the Linux mascot. Yeah, so I mean, it is a lot of good stuff going on there. Um, the evolution of Linux, I guess the, the size of that file, right? It's increased by a factor of almost 16. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Um, virtualization, cloud computing, and all this, for sure. It is the way to go. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I even have my um, if, this is the Ubuntu, but it is one of the main Linux distributions. It is simple. It has all the functionality. One of my, my main motivation for this was so that I could log on to my virtual machines that was running in the cloud. Because let's face it, you're not, uh, you're, and some of them, like in AWS, for example, you need to be able to connect to a virtual machine. Now, in, in the Google Cloud, you can just log on to the terminal and access your virtual machine directly from the website. Um, but depending on what you're working on, where your machines are located, um, it is kind of important to be able to access them and like if um, if I have a website running and I need to make changes or check on something I have to be able to log on and this is the way to do it um, you would just simply log on you'd have to have your keys and things like that not actually I think I do have a virtual machine running that I was supposed to shut down. I don't think I did. I'll have to spin it up and see if it's still running or not. Um, there are some that, in the free tier, um, if it's small enough and you don't have much stuff on there, you can get something. Um, it it might not necessarily be free though. Um, you still might get charged like four or five dollars, but you could.
probably use it as a as a web server for one thing. You know, um, you would still have to get a domain name um, and kind of configure it to where it to where you can get your IP addresses to point to it and all that stuff. But uh, there's ways to do certain things and even though it's in the free tier, it's somewhat still large. Like, you can have as many pages as you want. Um, and it can be used for other things as well. Right? Especially when it comes to cybersecurity and things like that. You know, phishing attacks and stuff like that. <laughs> So now they're talking a little bit about the different types of um, licensing, licenses and stuff like that. Pretty good stuff. It's all pretty straightforward. The Linux kernel and large parts of what one would otherwise consider Linux is distributed on the GPL. The GPL was developed by RMS for the GNU project and is supposed to ensure that the software that was originally distributed on the GPL remains on the GPL. Copy left license. So whenever you're using GPL, and you do things with it, it still has to mean, still has to keep its status. It still has to be in the GPL. So anybody should technically be able to access it. It is, ex uh, soft must be available in source form. It is expressed, it, it is expressly allowed to to modify the source and to distribute it unmodified or modified form as long as the receiver is given the same rights under the GPL. It is also expressly allowed to distribute or even sell GPL software in executable form. In this case, the source code included in the GPL rights must be furnished alongside the executables or must, during a certain period of time, be made available upon request. And the source code in this context means everything necessary to get the software to run on the computer. What that means in a particular case, for example, it, it includes the cryptographic keys necessary to start a modified Linux kernel on an appropriate locked down computer. And that is the subject of heated discussion. Now, if somebody buys a GPL software from any they naturally obtain the right to not just install that software on all the computers, but also to copy and resell it under the GPL. One consequence of this is that it does not make a lot of sense to sell GPL software per seat, but one important side benefit is that prices for Linux distributions stay reasonable. Now, if you write a new program incorporating parts of or a GPL program, the new program must also be placed under the GPL. Uh, so th there's a lot of technicalities, and, and I, I, you know, we can go down the rabbit hole. Um, and uh, there's a lot of, I mean, there, it's very heated, and this type of language is dealing with law, uh, lawsuits, and things of this sort, and. Um, we we don't really focus too much on this type of of things or topics. Yeah, in the in the Berkeley uh, spirit, <laughs> BS, the BSD license originated from UC Berkeley distribution is intentionally kept very simple. The recipient of the software is basically allowed to do with the software whatever they want. 
as long as they do not create the impression that their use is endorsed by the university. Um, there's, a, there's another one now, the MIT license. I don't, I don't know if it's going to appear here, but MIT has another license as well. Um, they, they have produced such great things. All right. Um, yep. Thunderbird is an email program. Chromium is the false variant of the Google browser Chrome. Chrome has recently started competing with Firefox. Firefox is there. So and these are all um, good programs. LibreOffice. That's one thing about the Linux distribution where you'll get the LibreOffice downloaded. So that, that's equivalent to like the Microsoft 365, right? Word, Excel, um, all of these other ones. Pretty interesting stuff, so. Oh, Blender. Yeah, Blender. Blender is actually super popular right now. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about Linux here and web service, internet service. And I guess the cool thing is when you're when you're working on there's there's an added security um, when you're working in a Linux machine, just of the the control of. of what you have over the machine. So um, quite often if, if it's compared to like a Windows machine, you just don't know or you cannot modify it. Um, it'd be illegal in order to use the software. You have to agree to the user agreement. There's no user agreements with Linux. Um, and you can really much go through. There's there's nothing hidden. Um, so you know, no nobody's going to get your data and things like this, right? Whereas your Microsoft data could be used to. I mean, you sign off on these things in the user agreement. And sometimes they ask you, do you, do you want to make Windows better? Do you want to send your data for diagnostics and stuff like that? Um, so it's kind of hard to to know what what they really have on you. Here's another Linux distribution, Red Hat. It is by now probably the largest corporation solely based on Linux and open source software. It was amazing how they were able to create this gigantic company S&P 500 stock index company based on a Linux distribution. Fedora is another one. Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So the the Red Hat Linux 
you know, furniture on GPL, plus lessons, you know, it's all here. It's good stuff. So these are some of the other softwares. Interesting stuff. Dubian, I mean, this is, you know, Apache. Ubuntu, the South African guys. Um, yeah, these are all the heavy hitters right here. Dimin, Ubuntu, Fedora, Red Hat. Okay, and then in um, chapter three and on and so on and so forth, they start to get into actually logging into the system, understanding the graph, the environment, the terminal, getting comfortable with the command line, things of that sort. Um, now in week two, though, we're going to jump over to week two. There's a lot, a lot more going on. There's this activity. The Linux is weird. You click on this. We'll take you to a YouTube channel, and then you can just answer these questions here. Um, now, this is where we'll probably spend most of our time in, in here, and this is an etiquette uh, course set up. So once you click in here and you sign in, um, I want you to do the first module, which is only chapter one, and it's kind of based on the first two chapters of what we read in the Essentials book. And then the operating systems as well, they talk the same thing. And then there's a chapter two exam. Um, and let's take a look at what that looks like. So here, you log in, you would get here. Module one has chapter one. There's nothing really to do other than read through it process at all. Chapter 2 under modules operating systems, this is what chapter 2 will look like. They give you a nice machine on the right side, Ubuntu. What are they? Okay, reset and do some things. It should spin up any second now. There we go. I can, I can log in as a root user. Um, and the password. I guess this would be the this would be the password. I'm already logged in as sysadmin, but I don't even think I have to type anything in yet. I think uh, this chapter is simply uh, talking about the different operating systems and what what an operating system is. And one of the best definitions I've seen here is operating system is software that runs on a computing device and manages the hardware and software components to make up a functional computing system. We all know what it is. Click Next. Okay, some good info. Talking a little bit about Windows 10, Mac OS, Linux. This is Linux here. Okay, but we will um, primarily be dealing with the second type of interface, which is the command line interface. And that's all you really need is the terminal and you can carry out all your tasks. Okay, some tasks might be a little harder than others. Like it's going to be hard to surf the internet 
in on the command line, but you can. And you can actually download the web page. Um, download web pages pretty easily. Uh, you can do a, you can do a lot. So there's a, there's a need for it. And it's all going to become clearer and clearer as we make our way through the course. Yeah, this graphic is pretty nice. This kind of lets you know on how things come came about. Yeah, as you can see, CentOS came about through the Red Hat Enterprise. Um, embedded systems, like VCRs, DVDs, printers, washing machines, <laughs> Um, mostly things that, that are part of the Internet of Things may have some kind of Linux distribution on them. Bluetooth and stuff running on them. Um, so that is what Chapter 2 boiled down to. Uh, let's do a, a quick sneak peek of the Chapter 2 exam. Um, you would expect about 10 questions. When choosing a distribution of Linux, you should consider all of these. Embedded systems means, okay, these are just good questions, okay. The most popular Linux platform for mobile phones is Linux distributions use this to aid to add and remove software from the system. Package Manager. Linux RPM can be defined as it's the package manager for Red Hat. Linux originally ran on Intel 386. All right, and uh, that's what the that's what the second week is going to look like. Um, there there are a couple of more things, and I'm going to tell you if you're listening to this, then you will know that you don't have to build the CentOS if you have another Linux distribution. And this is just a quick, fun little activity if you haven't already did it. Um, CentOS is available. So the file is here. I'll show you. iOS files. And there it is. It's, it's huge. It's a gig. This will run. This is a good ISO file, okay? I demonstrate this. Um, if you have uh, some kind of when we pull up a virtual box or in our case uh, this is a VMware Workstation 15 player it's probably outdated this is I've been having this for some time I have three different virtual machines for different things um, CentOS is here I could choose it and just hit play it's probably going to be super tiny. Yeah, <laughs> um, because it's not. It, it's not really. Um, I don't really play it on this screen. I have another screen that is set for. I'm going to get out of that. Yeah, just power it off. And then um, once you actually get the virtual machine running, it's just quite the task. It could be. Um, you might want to find some more resources online about that. Um, but once you actually do get it, let's go back. Um, the next thing we want you to do is carry out these next couple of commands. So under week two, you go to lab one entering shell commands. And, and so 
the commands that you're going to enter is found in the CompTIA Linux Plus student book on page 30. So that's actually here. If I go into files, go to ebooks, and pull up the CompTIA Linux Plus student book. You could just download it. Um, I'll download it. It's probably pretty big, but that's okay. Page 30. So it starts here. Actually, wait. This doesn't look like it. Let me make sure that it's not. OK, yeah, it's actually here. Um, it's 30, the 30th page from page from the cover um, but it's actually page 20 um, and because it's your own install you don't have to worry about this you don't have to log into it uh, the first thing they want you to do is type in a couple of things on the command line so, all right, I'm going to use my Ubuntu. Um, I do have it. You saw it, but I'm not going to use it for this example. But the first command is echo. And honestly, that echo command is a command that should be studied. Um, echo, I'm going to type, type echo. And, and, and echo is a shell built in. All right. So it, it's like a fundamental part that command the echo command is is really cool you can do a lot of cool things with the echo command and the first command that they want you to do is do an echo and then print hello world close brackets it does it it basically prints out it echoes whatever you put in in quotes. So you have this power of, of, of if you needed to issue a command, you can do that. Um, but I, I always use double quotes because I'm old fashioned. All right. So if I want to, let me. Um, I'm going to create a new folder, make directory, and I'm going to call it it240. And now what I'm going to do is change the directory. Um, and I'm going to get into it40. Okay, good. So now I'm there ls to list all the files. There's nothing in this folder. Um, if I do ls all, there's literally nothing. Um, but what I could do is create a file. Right, and I'll call it high txt. So you, <coughs> excuse me, there's a there's a command called touch. And it will allow you to create. And it touches another command that we can analyze and understand the nuances and what is it input, how does it work, even find the code of it. But the word touch allows you to create a text file if you wanted to. So I'm going to call it touch high.txt. 
So now if I list out my files in my folder, I actually have one thing, but it's blank. There's nothing in it. Um, but echo with echo, I could actually put something in it. If I do hello world, what I've just done was print hello world, but I've directed it to the first line of that text file that we got. And so now if I go back to that text file, um, it may not be empty anymore. All right, one way to check is to do cat, right? I think of literally a cat, the cat command. But um, if you do cat hide txt, it will list out everything in that file. And so um, we're going to be learning some of the basic commands once we get into more chapter uh, week three, week four. These are just some of the most simplest basic commands that I can think of to, to demonstrate. And you're going to do this lab that enables you to kind of practice entering the commands and then they'll become, they'll stick as you use them more and more. Now, there, I mean, there, there, there was a way for me to do this without even touching the file. I could just direct that echo world, hello world, into whatever file I wanted to, and it will create it and set it up as well. So there, there's ways to do that, and we will, we will look at that soon as well. Um, and also, there is a text editor. And there's a couple. We could do nano high text file, and there it there it is. Um, I need to get out of this though. Okay. At the very bottom, uh, save mod modify better. No, just get out of it. So nano is a, a text file where you can actually. It's a program where you can create a text file or a script, or uh, you know, it's not really like a Microsoft Word. And, you know, you don't want to. It's mostly used for um, coding, to writing your scripts, your program code inside that text editor. That's primarily what it's used for. Um, but you could technically probably write anything in there. I mean, a regular file that you wanted to write. And there's another one called Vim. And that's the one that we probably would use more often. So if I do VI or Vim, high txt, it opens up. There it is. I can exit this. I can get out of this like that. Um, so that hide.txt file, I'm going to remove that now. Let's just get rid of it. It's gone. Nothing's there anymore. But if I list out all my files, it's completely empty, uh, an empty directory. All right, let's bring it back. And this time we're going to do hello world. And I'm going to create that hide.txt file again. And let's do a cat hide.txt, and it's back. We just created it back. And we can see when it was created by doing lsl, which lists out the files in, um, in the long format way. And it lets us know a little bit about when the file was first created, it, who created it, and what type of permissions does that file have. Um, and these are all, I guess, default. Let's hit clear. Sometimes clear is nice as a really nice feature because you want to 
be able to, it can get messy on the terminal. And so once you hit clear, it's going to wipe everything away from you. There are no games, you know, when you type your command and hit enter, that is what will be executed. Um, you know, it's quick, it's easy versus messing around the operating system with Windows or uh, sometimes when you tell it to do something, it might do it temporarily, but it may not really be gone, right? It could be in the recycle bin, and then they might ask you to permanently delete it, and you do it, and then they might have it somewhere else stored somewhere. In this, they don't play those types of games. When you hit remove, it has been removed. It has been erased off the buffer. Um, and that's kind of nice. It, it gives you a little bit more control. It's almost like driving a manual versus driving an automatic when you have a sports car. All right. There is a difference. Um, so I'm going to leave that file in there, and I'm going to get out of this. Gone. All right. So that's going to wrap it up for this week's lecture video, guys. Um, just really wanted you to get prepared for week two. Week three will be published soon, um, and um, and then we're we're gonna move on. But because we've only did uh, modules one and two, I think in week three we'll probably do modules three and four. We don't need to skip those. Uh, module six and seven will probably get pushed back a little bit later. So. Um, we're going to do things in order in the Natacad website. And once we get them all done, then we'll move on to doing some more of the, probably the Linux Journey modules. We'll do some of these, and they're all pretty straightforward. Um, and various tasks like that. But that's going to do it for this week's lecture video. Thank you for watching, and hope you have a nice week ahead. Bye.